great to see you here tonight for this listening session for the IDD. And um, we appreciate your interest and your input tonight with Mr. Dave Richard. We also have with us tonight Representative Rena Turner from Iredale. Would you stand, Rena? We appreciate your being here. Do we have any other officials here? Elected officials? Maynard Taylor, Burke County Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we have refreshments in the back. There are, is water and all kinds of uh, snacks, and, and you're welcome to those. Also, a partner's bag. Uh, I am Gail Mitchell, uh, Consumer and Family um, Advisory Chair for Partners, and we welcome you tonight to Partners Behavioral Health Care Facility. Without further ado, this person needs no introduction because he has made himself accessible to each and every one in this room and has a wonderful and dedicated interest in this group tonight. And so we present to you the Deputy Secretary of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Services, Dave Richard. But thank you very much. It's really very kind. And first of all, let me start off by saying how much we appreciate partners and the CFAC for pulling this together because uh, we were relatively organized, but it was a kind of late ass, wasn't it? So y'all did a terrific job. He's getting a lot of people out um, tonight and making sure that this was there. So thank you so much, and, and uh, we value uh, the CFAC. And if you don't know much about it, you know, talk to folks afterward because it's something we really think people ought to be engaged in. It's a really uh, important component of what we do. Um, I want to also thank you all for coming because I know uh, giving up uh, time on the evening when everybody's busy and you have a lot of other things going on to come to talk about things that are um, actually not the most exciting thing in the world, right? Uh, it's really um, a, a terrific thing for you to do. We appreciate that. It actually is exciting because it's about your life. You want to see that um, change and be excited as you go forward, but we know it's hard to take time out your schedule to do that. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, a couple of things I just want to say about what we're doing, and one is I want to make sure you know about the state staff that are here, and they, they're all going to raise their hands and want to introduce you. Raise your hands, state staff. So Holly Riddle, who was with the Division of Mental Health Development Disabilities and Substance Abuse. Stacy in the back, same division, because if I say the whole thing again, it's confusing. And here we have Suzanne from the same division do that. And Deb Godo, who was with the Division of Medical Assistance. So just so you know that the... Um, Division of Mental Health, Indian Substance Abuse, obviously covers that broad scope of what we do, and it's a programmatic division inside of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, it has responsibility for a lot of state funds and how do we manage and work together in terms of providing those services. It also has a real close relationship with Division of Medical Assistance, who, who, who is the responsibility for funding uh, the Medicaid services in North Carolina. That is representative of that um, division. And what we hope you see tonight is that there's an absolute close uh, relationship between the two organizations and how we work on this. Because you can't do these kinds of waivers without having kind of programmatic staff that exists and also, obviously, the funding expertise and knowledge as we go forward. There are also uh, folks here from the LMEMCO, and I, and I don't want to call everybody's name, but I appreciate it. people raise their hand so you know that, that we're well, on wow. back, too. That's pretty cool on that side of it. Excuse me? Partners and smoky staff here. So that's great. Now, I, I say this because what I, what, I, what I frame this conversation as is it's a conversation. And that's what we want to have. And, and uh, this is about the future of our developmental disability service system, about how we, how we want to operate in the future, what we want to look like as we go forward. And what we're saying, and I want to be clear to folks, this isn't, um, this isn't a division of mental health uh, system. It's not a uh, Medicaid system. It's not an LMEMCO mm -hmm. system. Honestly, it's the state of North Carolina and its citizens system. It's the system that is designed to support families and people with disabilities, and we all have a stake in it. Uh, and that, that includes people who aren't um, directly impacted with this. Citizens of North Carolina have a stake in this. 
And we appreciate you being here because you represent, uh, both of you, the elected officials represent the citizens of the state, and we want to make sure that we are doing the right thing um, as we're planning our future in terms of development and disability services. Um, we are, we're going around the state uh, the next two months uh, in just about, uh, we're not going to do Murphy to Matteo, we're going to do Western McDowell County or somewhere, that far west, all the way to uh, Elizabeth City, so we're getting pretty close in terms of having these meetings. And in Adam, our intention is we'll have the same kind of groups of folks. We have uh, people who have disabilities, family members, state staff, LMEMCO staff, providers, uh, and folks who are just interested in uh, what happens in our system. Because that's the, that's the way I think the, the value that we have should work, is that we develop something that meets the needs of individuals across North Carolina. Um, I know tonight we'll talk a lot about uh, the Innovations Waiver. Um, but I want to be clear, it's not only about the Innovations Waiver. There are certain things that we have to do about a time frame around submitting new things to the Innovations Waiver, uh, but it's about the entire system. So we will frame it in that way and expect that we'll have conversation about a lot of things, um, but it's not just about that waiver as we go forward. Um, a couple of ground rules that we kind of want to start with, and, and uh, one is that we really want it to be a conversation. Uh, we really want to be absolutely uh, frank with each other about what can and can't be done. We want to hear from you what you think are possible, what things that you'd like to see. Um, I'm convinced that uh, people who disagree uh, can actually have really good conversations together. And so we may disagree on things, but what I'd ask is that we're really polite about how we do that and that um, you can, and I'll tell you this up front, if you want to beat up on me, yep. I'm fair game. Um, and I took this gig as a, sort of an appointment from the, the secretary, so that's fine. But, but the state staff, they, they're here, and the LBMCO staff are here, trying to do the best they can uh, to make sure this works. So I hope if, if we have a conversation uh, around these things and, and things that, that we're, we're really just are honest and uh, frank, but uh, do it in a kind uh, way and, and make sure we can do that. The other thing is, is that we're not going to set a time limit on what people say. Um, but I do reserve the right to kind of um, jump in and say maybe maybe it's gone too long. And, and I know some of you here, and, and and you know me, and I can talk for a long time, and I know some of you can do the same thing. So we may have to uh, cut it off, but it won't be as a um, an intention to uh, stop the conversation, but rather to make sure we honor that uh, two and a half hour time frame that we set aside. We, we don't have to take all of it, but uh, that period, and so that people can get back to home and also everybody else. Um, it is a listening uh, session, and we want to listen, um, but, but we're, we're state staff, we, we have a chance to talk a little bit, so we have to do that first, and we want to frame uh, the conversation a little bit, so if you indulge us and, and indulge me, frankly, for a little bit, maybe 15 minutes to talk about what we think and what we're trying to achieve and what the vision is of, um, of, of what we believe uh, this system ought to be. We want to check it with you to see if that makes sense, and then we really do want to hear um, what you have to say. Uh, last night, we were in Winston-Salem, and uh, I, we had a crowd about the same size. And, uh, and what I'd say is, uh, when we came back, what we all felt was, um, man, we heard a lot of great things. Um, and, and they were uh, things that were very specific about the waiver. They were things that were really broad about uh, the system. There were some ideas, frankly, we never thought about. Uh, things that, that, that's what we want to have. We let people uh, engage in that conversation. And then we were able to, to dialogue, so we got a little bit more information about things we thought we'd do, um, but maybe we'll be inaccurate. And I think that's the, uh, that was the spirit, and it came across that way. So it was very, to us, very exciting, because that was the kind of uh, dialogue we had. The one thing that we heard back from folks that we're trying to adjust real quickly on is that um, I used way too many acronyms. I, um, I, I forgot that the audience um, probably doesn't uh, use those acronym, acronyms every day, so I'm going to try really hard uh, to not do that. Um, but I promise you that sometime tonight, one of us, probably Deb, she'll slip, and uh, no, I'll probably will slip and, and walk into language that you won't understand. And what I beg of you is to raise your hand or just scream out and say, stop. You know, tell me what that means, stop the acronyms, so we get back online. So I, we really want to commit to you to do that and, and do that, that as we go forward. So uh, let me start out by, by um, talking a little bit about what, why we're doing this. Um, mm -hmm. Secretary Bosch, who is uh, the DHHS secretary, 
uh, has said to our team, she said a couple things. One is that you guys work together, you figure this out, but she said, you know, we've done a lot of work, and we have over the past uh, 15, 16 months on trying to make sure that our system works really well. Uh, we're concentrating a lot on mental health issues as we're going forward, um, but we have to concentrate on development of spillers. We have to make sure that our system is robust, the one that works for people, and that we have to look at how we do business. Um, and, and the only way we can do that, the only best way to do that is to get out and talk to people about what that system should look like. And her expectation is that we're going to do this over the next couple of months. Um, we have some very targeted timelines we have for our, um, uh, our waiver submission. Um, but the entire media system question is one that she wants to hear this because she's expecting us to give her a plan. Um, by the end of October, so that we have something that looks that she can begin to work with in terms of governor's policy and other things. So we are we're working hard at making sure we hear what you have to say. But to talk about that, I think we have to set forth in a vision. And the way I'd like to talk about it a little bit is if you indulge me a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I know a lot of you, but but I, I want to tell you that because it's it, um, I've been around a long time, not in North Carolina. Well, a long time in North Carolina, but in, in other states. In fact, I kind of grew up um, around uh, development of disabilities. And I grew up not because of a family member or any other thing, but grew up because when I was a, a young man, my sister was a special ed teacher. I was getting ready to go into high school. And uh, my parents felt I should do something other than hang around the house and watch TV. Uh, my sister uh, sort of worked as an advisor to something called a Youth Arc at the time, which was a um, an organization that, that uh, were, were teenagers that provided um, support for people with disabilities and really advocated for that role. It was back in Louisiana, and this was in the um, early 70s, and, and, I, and I recall going to the first meeting and getting all excited about that, and, and I confessed pretty early because there were a lot of teenage girls at that meeting, so that was the first reason I got really excited about it, but, but really learned a lot very quickly because a lot of the people that were there had brothers and sisters who had disabilities and they talked a lot about it. And one of the things we did is a summer day camp. And we did a month-long summer day camp that we rotated weeks out. And families brought their sons and daughters with disabilities, and they brought people with disabilities who had mild disabilities, but they brought a lot of folks who had very significant disabilities. Um, and they brought them to a camp run by teenagers. Some adult supervision, uh, none of it paid adult supervision, None of it with any kind of regulatory environment that said you have to have these things in place. <coughs> Frankly, if we tried to do that today, it would be shut down tomorrow, right, mm -hmm. by somebody. And, uh, and probably not the right answer, because honestly, mm -hmm. what happened was some pretty good things that happened for people. But what, what was happening was that this summer day camp, I thought, was a great experience for teenagers and a great experience for the folks coming. <laughs> but in 1970, in Indiana, it was actually the only respite service that most families had. Uh, there wasn't a lot of paid respite in the state at the time. And frankly, uh, most people was the only service that they were getting in, in the state other at that time than the state um, institutions. Um, and I, I told the story is I remember one of my good friends had a brother and a sister who both had very severe disabilities and had a single mom. And, and uh, as I would talk to her mom, it didn't hit me then. Uh, this is one of the only things she had any relief on. Uh, during the entire year, it was a summer day camp. Uh, but her vision, her her desire, had one daughter that lived in a state facility, and her desire was her son would be able to live in that same state facility. We'll call it an institution today. And and I'm not saying anything negative about the facilities, but her reasoning was is that she knew that if she passed away, there was absolutely no body that would take care of the son and daughter. And it was a terribly tragic view of life that that she had. And uh, I. It didn't again hit me then, it hit me later um, that, that um, boy, that, that isn't the way life ought to be. Right? We ought to have a very different view about what, what should happen and how people with disabilities can learn and do a lot of other different things. Um, I'm very fortunate I got to work for the art for a lot of years in different places and got to see the evolution and change and what happened across our country as we thought about things. And I, I won't bore you with a lot of details, but I'll tell you a couple of things that I think are the, the sort of highlights of, of what, what we've done. One is that you know, back in the in the days when when I was I was in Delaware and we would talk about adding services and um, I remember having a fight with the budget director for the governor at that time and the argument was about 
a, um, and don't, don't make that sound like a big deal because Delaware's got 600,000 people, so everybody knew the budget director and everybody else in the state. So the, uh, the service is that what we're talking about is, is something around $30,000 that we were planning to build and have a group home. Remember, this is quite a few years back. And then he was arguing with me about it's too much money. Yeah. You know? And I said, well, you know what a lot of families tell me is if you cut that in half, and you actually gave them that amount of money to support their son and daughter, they'd actually yeah. be pretty happy. Now, again, $15,000 and $1980 is a whole different story. But we weren't talking self-determination then, and I know yeah. a lot of folks here are really interested in self-determination. Nobody was using those words. But honestly, that's what yeah. people were saying. And the idea being is that, you know, if you kind of give me some control over what goes on, so the family member and the person with disability actually can do a better job often than you experts, and I'll work with great providers to do great services, yeah. but we really have to be more flexible. We have to figure out yeah, how to do those yeah. things. And really, when you think about the self-determination movement, we think a lot about freedom and, yeah. and uh, choice and control and authority. One thing we kind of don't talk a lot about is the other tenet yeah. of that is responsibility, and that responsibility that uh, we all have. And we all have for each other, and we have for other people out of similar circumstance, and, and, and frankly, our entire system. Yeah. And so I, I like to think that our values have to be based on that, the values of our system, on the self-determination view, but remembering that you know, freedom and authority and uh, self-direction come with that whole idea of responsibility, and that responsibility as is, is, uh, citizens of how we do work. What, what I think we're saying and what we all talk about is that you know, our vision and what we want is something that says that we want to have a system that allows for people with disabilities to be supported, to live in communities, um, to work in those communities and to express their recreational needs and their desires in a way that most everybody else has. And that we're talking about a support system, one that, um, that isn't uh, determined about uh, whether or not you meet certain goals every day, but yeah. one that supports the idea that people have that option, um, but, but is something that is long-term uh, and that we don't uh, back away from <laughs> it going on. Because uh, I think people need to have some consistency and knowledge that the system's going to be there yeah. long-term if we're going to provide these services. And that's what we believe, um, that that's how it should look. Uh, but yeah. with no, no um, disrespect for anybody that's uh, developed and worked in the system for a long time, the people that manage it today, um, over the years we've yeah. developed a system that sometimes doesn't do that. Um, it, is, it is significantly bureaucratic. Uh, those of you that are providers, I suspect, Every day you see that. Um, if you're a family yeah. member, you understand that our rules sometimes can be archaic and don't seem to make a lot of sense in how we do it. Um, we talk about self-determination a lot, but if you're going to choose the self-directed yeah. models that we have in our waiver, um, and, uh, then frankly, <coughs> you have to be a genius to be able to do it, I think. Um, I'm not sure uh, anybody should, should try to take those options at this point. Um, and but we hear from people, and I think this is accurate, we get to go around and state a lot, we hear from people on some other things. You know, we, we hear that there's really no trust. Nope. Not because the people aren't trustworthy, and I want to say that over and again. I, I, for a while, used to think that that was what we were saying. But because the system doesn't seem to be trustworthy. But, you know, for those of you that have been around for a while, in several years, uh, you know, maybe if you've been on an innovations waiver or had that support for 10 years, I suspect you've gone through 10 changes. Um, during that period of time. And, and it wasn't because people are trying to mess with you, it's because the system evolves that way. And every time we change something, we know it disrupts people's lives. And we have to really be serious about not doing that. We, we talk about person-centered planning yeah. and the idea that it ought to start with the individual. Um, but often what our person-centered yeah. planning reverts to is um, a, a form and a form that has a lot of check boxes, and a form that really has to cover every base. And sometimes uh, what we miss is the person inside of that form process. Now, I'm going to say when I say these things, that is not wow. an indictment, and it doesn't mean it happens all the time. Um, but we hear that a lot, and I think if you really think about it, it's probably accurate. You know, the whole person-centered planning theory is really about that, right? It's about the individual. And honestly, a form doesn't do that justice. Uh, I had a, a good friend who really did a lot of work early on in the 70s and around person-centered planning. And, and, and I was in Louisiana, I was so gung ho we were going to make sure that everybody had to have a person-centered plan, and it was going to be a part of this. And he looked at me and said, the, the day you mandate person-centered planning is the day you'll stop having person-centered planning. Um, because once you mandate it, it becomes so part of the system, you lose the value of it. So we've got to figure out how to 
make those values come back into our system in a way that, that, that really supports people differently. Um, I think my opinion, and I think most everybody on our team agrees with this, is that we've got to do something that supports innovation and the use of technology as we go forward. Is that we have we have great opportunities to use enabling technology, but we have an awful lot of barriers um, between people being able to use that. Some of it's our regulatory environment, some of it's the way we fund services. Frankly, some of it's just because we don't talk about it enough and we don't make it available for people to do that. And and we we frankly have to get out of the way sometimes um, to encourage innovation. Uh, that, that we have really smart people at the state level, but honestly, the innovation is never going to happen there. It's going to happen at the local level with families and providers, and you working with the management entities you work with. Uh, our innovation has got to be, how do we get most of this out of your way so that you can do really great stuff? And that's really what we ought to do as a state agency. And I think, I think we're all there. We want to do that. Um, and then... A couple of things that, that people have said is that this isn't equitable. You know, the system is not equitable at all. And, and I think that if, if, you, if you are um, somebody who is on a waiting list, I think your, your answer has got to be absolutely, there's no equity there, right? Um, if you even are on, have an innovations waiver slot, um, there's inequity between how services are developed. And I want to stop right there because. I've heard people say in hush corner sometimes that when people have really large budgets um, in the innovations waiver and you can't figure out why that looks like, you hear people say, well, that's because that family's greedy. And I want to be real clear, there's not a soul in this room at the state agency level, and I guarantee you not at the LMEMC level that believes that. What we know is people fight for their sons and daughters. And sometimes fighting for sons and daughters, you fight for things that maybe you don't always need, but you need sometimes. And you fight for that because you know you might need it in the future, and you do those things because that's what parents do, and that's what families do, is they fight for their sons and daughters. And that's what we view with this is, is that that is a, about what <coughs> folks are doing. But this system is inequitable. And it's not just about the innovation waiver. It's about if you have state funds and no services provided by the federal Medicaid program, that's not equitable either. And here's a little secret. We don't distribute it equitably to the LMEMCOs, and I, I don't know what Partners and Smokies numbers are compared to everybody else, but I guarantee you uh, that the per capita amount of state money they get is different, uh, and it's different because of historical purposes, not because anything that people have done. So there's a, a real inequity in how we manage the system as we do that. Um, and there's inequity between what we provide for services in our large state facilities, in our community ICFs, and our community programs. Uh, and so we know we've got to deal with those issues. Now, when I say this, I'm not talking about in terms of the legal standpoint of those issues. That you know, people can get all up in arms about that. What I'm saying in terms of the value that we have, how do you create an equitable system that yeah. works for everybody and, uh, and it's responsive to people's needs? So that's one of the things that we know is true about um, what our system needs. And then um, we're not always that efficient. Uh, we have a lot of regulatory requirements that, frankly, have been added on over the years that create inefficiencies, and we need to sort of begin to think differently about that. I will say that um, what we do believe is that the way this system ought to start, it ought to start with the individual. It's got to be about people, and it's got to be about person centeredness. <clears throat> so we're committed to, to making that work. Um, and as we do that, uh, we can begin to change some of the other dynamics that, that our system does. Um, we think that uh, what we need is something that's predictable. Uh, and I, I believe this, and I am convinced that this is the right way to go, is that we need to change from a system that is built upon stacking service upon service to one that gives uh, individual budget uh, that people know from year to year how much money is available to spend on services. Uh, we have to create something that does that because if not, uh, our system uh, is not equitable and it's not sustainable. So we want to talk about that. Um, and I want to be clear that in exchange for that, we have to create something that's much more flexible. And somebody challenged yesterday, and they were absolutely right. We don't want to say to you is that we want a really flexible system so we throw everything else out. But what we need to do is evolve to something that's really flexible, um, that allows for a real person to have a plan to design how services are provided to sons and daughters and to individuals. And we need to do that across the entire system, not just our innovations waiver, but everything else we do. Uh, we know we have too many people on a waiting list. Yeah. And we have to address that. 
and we have to figure out how to do it together as we go forward. Oh, it's not going to be easy because there isn't a ton of money that's going to drop out the sky to do it. We have to find ways to make sure that we're doing this <laughs> in a steady stream, uh, that we begin to build upon our successes, and that we uh, find creative ways to be able to make that happen. Um, we want to build upon what works. A lot of times we just tore down everything that we've uh, done and started all over. Well, we can't do that again. Uh, we have an LBM system <coughs> that is just relatively new starting. We want to build upon that system to make sure that it is the best that can be. And we want to support people in the best way we can do that. So uh, we know, we know just as we know at the state that we'll, we'll, uh, we make a lot of mistakes. Uh, we try to correct them when we do. Uh, we know LME MCOs make mistakes. Uh, we also know that providers do. And I bet that everybody in this room, if you really truthful, will admit that sometime today uh, you made a mistake uh, that you wish you would have done differently. I can tell you I probably had five or six yeah. before I got here. Um, and before I leave, I'll make another one. I, I guarantee you that'll happen. But we got to correct those. Uh, and we got to get better. We've got to get quality with our, our, our key components we go forward. Uh, two other things I want to I want to mention about what we know. Um, number one is that uh, what I've learned is that when I talk to people uh, who are advocates for uh, mental health needs and substance use, the recovery system is absolutely the thing we ought to be talking about. Uh, people do recover. It should be based upon that recovery model. Uh, it's absolutely the future of where we need to go. We need to have that embedded in everything we do. Um, but that is not the same model that we should base our IVD system on, the election of the uh, These are long-term needs. Uh, people don't recover. People have great opportunities to be better and have a great chance to integrate in their communities and do wonderful things. Um, but it's not about a recovery model. And we can't base this system on that. Um, so we should not base services on do people get better. We should base services on how do we support people to live best in their communities. And I think that's the commitment we all have as we go forward. Um, it doesn't say, it's really clear, it doesn't say that if somebody with an intellectual disability also has a mental health need, that we shouldn't have those recovery principles apply for the <coughs> mental health services. They should. Um, but it does say our system has to be based on supports. Um, we have a lot of tools that we use. You know, um, the innovations waiver is one. Our ICF program is one. The state dollars that we provide is another. We have this thing called B3 services. And that's getting a jargon, but it's a way in which we can use savings in the managed care waiver to provide services that look a lot like the um, innovations waiver services. Uh, we have a lot of other kinds of uh, monies that tie into our system. We have to use all the tools. And that's why it's got to be a conversation about all of those things, not just about the innovations waiver. Um, so just the last few words um, as we go forward. <coughs> our, our value, a fundamental value, is that we believe that we do this together. Um, that that uh, we can't figure this thing out, and we can't get it better by ourselves. When I say those things, it doesn't mean that we believe everything in this system is broken, because it's not. There are a lot of good things happening across North Carolina. Um, I, I would say to you that the early um, advocates in the IDD world, if they saw some of the things that we were doing today, they would have thought they had died and gone out. Because nobody could have imagined the kind of things that are going on with people with disabilities and kind of supports that people get. And I think we have to recognize that. We have to be honest that there are a lot of good things going on. What we want to do is achieve a high quality system, one that continues to evolve, one that's equitable, sustainable, and uh, gives people confidence that it will be there for as we go forward. Uh, so that's really what the conversation ought to be about. A couple of things that, that you should know about this process. Two week, two months, we're going to be out across the state. We'll be listening. We'll have a way for you to, to sort of see what everybody else is saying. Probably next week, you'll be able to get a link on our website to begin seeing those things uh, as they're going out. Um, it isn't the last time we'll talk. Uh, we'll put those out. We'll tell you what we're thinking. Uh, we, we think we ought to be designing stuff, and we'll ask for your feedback on that. One specific timeline we do have is our innovations waiver. Uh, our intention is to submit a, um, a revision to that waiver uh, sometime in the winter, spring of 2015. Almost my years right. With the goal of by December 31st of 2015, we're ready to launch that next day uh, with those changes. 
So although this isn't about the innovations waiver, we do want to hear your comments on it. Friday in Raleigh, we have a stakeholder group that is invited of representatives of lots of associations, plus four members recommended to us for the CFAX, families and consumers, um, and a public meeting. Anybody's willing to go. But we'll begin talking about that waiver there. The things you say tonight will be part of that conversation on Friday. The things people say next week and the week after will continue to be part of that stakeholder conversation because we want to ingrain what we hear from these members. Last thing I'll say, and then we'll shut up and open up the door. One of them is that the thing is that we may not be able to do everything we want to do. In fact, I'm guaranteeing uh, there will be a lot of things that people want to do that we can't. Part of it will be because feds won't let us. Part of it will be because it's not how we want to manage a system and we don't think we can do that. Part of it will be just because we don't have enough money to do everything that we want to do. Um, but what I'll guarantee you is that we'll listen to you. We'll hear what you have to say. Uh, we'll make sure we understand what you have to say. And you'll have every opportunity to continue to tell us what you have to say throughout this process. Um, that everybody's comments are valuable. Everything that people say are going to be recorded. Uh, and that will respond, uh, maybe not individually on that process, but we will continue to respond to you. So we're going to open it up for comments and conversation. I'm going to try to call on people. Um, Deb and others will sort of write stuff down. Deb and Holly, are, or Deb in particular, is the expert on the um, innovations waiver. So if we have things that um, I start to, to mangle, she'll jump in and uh, tell you the truth. So uh, we fix those things. Um, but but our goal is this is a it's a conversation. It's not a uh, it's not the kind of formal meeting. So just raise your hand. We'll call on you. Say what you want to say, and, and we might ask you questions back so we understand what they're doing. First things first, could you please say the date, time, and place of the meeting Friday that's the public meeting? Friday, tomorrow. September, whatever tomorrow is, 6th? 5th, 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 and the name of that committee? We're calling it a um, IDD stakeholder group. Thank you. Mary, I just have to say, you know, when you, we love you being able to record this and put it out there, but it is a tad bit intimidating uh, when you do that. So just know that. I'm focusing on you guys, not the audience. No, that's good. So I just want to make sure you know that. All right. Okay. I want them to know it. Yes, ma'am. I do want to start off with a positive thing. Um, I am a provider. Uh, we do work with agent, uh, MCOs all the way across the state. I do appreciate that Partners and Smokey, and they're trying to <coughs> come together on the western side. I wish we could get the entire state on the same page. I have MCOs that interpret things differently, demand different things, require different things. Um, <clears throat> and it's slightly challenging, but I do appreciate the western side of the state really trying to get on the same page. Um, you mentioned a point about trust, and that's very valid, and some of the things I'm hearing from families that we support is that everything seems to be coming under one roof. The MCO is the one who is hiring the SIS evaluator there. The MCO is the one who has the care coordinator who is suggesting what's appropriate and what's not mm. appropriate. It is the MCO who is approving whether families can work or not. It is the MCO who is paying for all these services and getting approval for services. And although it has been presented and said that these are all separate departments and they're kept separately, I'm sure everyone in this room has had instances where that's not the case. Um, the papers are shuffled from one department to another, and it, it, the lines are not very clear. So I think that's where the trust issue is coming in from a lot of the families that we support. I think that's, that's, that's really a great uh, comment. And, and just, just a comment that I think we appreciate partners and Spokey doing that. And what I'll tell you is that our, our goal, and I think the goals of all the LGBTs, you know, is that we're, we're doing more of that. They are in a, in, a, in a really difficult circumstance because they are, as a, as a business, at risk. Uh, they have to manage that risk. That's what our expectation is for them. 
So we understand that there are going to be some, some of those differences. But what we want to see is, I think, the system, I think everybody does, so where you know, if you're a family member and you move from one place to the other, you kind of know what's going to happen. right? You have a sense that this is North Carolina, this is the way it's going to look. With the regional differences, that allows for the creativity that helps you. And that, that's sort of the, the goal. And I think that's the goal of all of us, and that's the Alameda Sierra goal. But I think saying it, putting it down in paper, is really helpful for us. Yes, ma'am. One way to make sure the system is fair for everybody is to make sure that everyone who is a recipient of these uh, services has adequate access to the process. So what's being done or what is being considered is making sure that you know, we do have different time frames for reconsideration review than we do for the uh, state appeal process. And there, there are some real serious issues going on with uh, with appeals, uh, and we need to address those. If we're going to have a fair system, that's where we get hurt. That's where the individual who's a recipient of these services has their day in court uh, over the MCO uh, to be able to have those those inequities addressed. And that's, I mean, point blank. You know, we don't have a fair appeals process going on right now. Seriously, I can testify because I've been through what she's saying. I've used my dollars and advance. In the appeal to exceed 84 hours, mediation was never offered. Never so, so, offered. So one thing I'm going to ask, and, and I'm, I'm only going to ask this out of respect for, for you and everybody else, is that I don't think I don't think we should get into very specific circumstances in terms of that in the public setting. I'm happy to talk afterward again, but I think. What I think we've heard from, from you is that we've got, we, we got work to do around how do we present due process with that system. Well, and, and, we, and we agree that. that the managed care organization ought to be able to have an internal process, but those time frames are set up from the beginning for the family to fail or the recipient to fail on, on their due process. Uh, you, you have a 15-day period to appeal the managed care organization, those appeals, those reconsideration reviews are taking up to 45 days, and you have 30 days for an appeal to happen. Um, yeah, that's a problem. That's that's where you, you need a PhD to kind of cipher through what we need to do and when we need to do it. And Dave, with all due respect, I think that's one of the problems. People need to hear what's going on. Well, I'm, and, and again, I'm not... Everyone in this room needs to know what's going on. Okay? You know, trying to put this stuff under the rug is not the way it needs to be done. The due process being violated, mediation was not offered, and we got down to court. There was an intimidation mediation. You know who the mediator was? Partner's attorney. That the administrative law judge are allowed to have, okay? Again, yeah, but what I would what I, what I would really ask is that we have that conversation on Not because we're trying to put anything on the right. I, I, I think it's pretty clear is that the, the comment is is that we have to we have to look at our due process system. I think that's a fair, absolute thing that we should put down on it, and I think mean, that's the way we'll go about it. But hopefully, we can have a different conversation. Can I add something to that due process issue? The fact that the law changed so that the burden of proof is now on the recipient is a really big deal. If you're trying to get your information together to go to court, because it's now up to Katie to prove the case, it's not, and we don't have access to the information. Like you just suddenly saying, there's this, this meeting tomorrow that's a public meeting, but it's nowhere on your website, Dave. Nowhere. That's a fair comment. We'll put it down make sure that it's going to be everywhere it needs to be. I'm with the intermediate care facility provider and was just uh, wondering, is there going to be any type, I know we do the MC SNAPs and different uh, variations of assessments, but in looking... Mm -hmm. The three years is coming up with our contract with MCO. Mm. Will they be looking at the individual's needs now instead of looking at us as a whole group, one per diem per client? You understand what I'm saying? Great question. And, and I, and, okay, I, I'm honestly, I don't know. Okay. 
when the contract ends, but we'll get back to you. We'll make sure we post okay. that. Okay, I, I think that's something and, that... And, I'm, and, and let me... Your, your recommendation would be... That there be a, some of, someone from the MCO come and see these individuals and, and do an assessment and say, okay, this is a higher need, this one needs less money, this yeah. one needs more. So actually doing doing much more of an individual kind of budget yes. to get level also. So an individual versus uh, your facility rate. Exactly. Yes, ma'am. Um, I work at a day program for adults with development disabilities, and honestly, I would like to see the return of case management, um, case management services. When the case management services were done away with, <coughs> all that fell on the providers of day programs, PSRs, residential, and um, so we were expected to pick up these services with no additional funding. Now, the MCO and the care coordination services provide a needed function, and it's a, it's a good function, um, but it's not a replacement for the in-community stuff that, you know, the case management provided. And that's such a vital, vital part of, of you know, for the families and, and the bridge between the families and the providers and stuff like that. And it's just really been kind of a mess without case management. I don't want to put words you want, but is it, it's the functions, certain functions that were provided by case management. Oh, yes, sir. That, that you described. Maybe not necessarily the case management, but those functions showing back up somewhere. So. A lot of the functions. I mean, it, it, and it's just it's falling back on the providers. And we're doing the best we can, but we're not case managers. And, and all the extra stuff that comes with providing case management services, per se, <laughs> there has not been any funding to reimburse the time and the effort that goes into trying to help the families that need it because case management services went away. So in the reform or revision and that kind of thing, I just think <coughs> case management services is a vital part of um, helping the families with a much needed service. Okay. I also had notes about case management and providers bearing the burden of providing a much needed service, care coordination, um, is not helpful to the person on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, case management is best practice for people with IDD, and it's not being offered by the state of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion and talk about best practice, evidence-based, and yet the clear best practice for people with IDD is case management, as is supported employment. Um, so I wonder what you have to say about that. Take <laughs> pause for a second. Let's start with supported employment. Let's go that side. Um, well, I will say that there was a survey done recently that indicated what do people do that employment for people with IDD ends at 60. I responded to that survey going, excuse me? No, the 60 is not the cutoff just because someone has IDD. I don't know where Everyone, that came from. It was a survey generated out of partners, I believe. Um, so I, I have concerns with whoever thought 60 was a nice age for people with IDD to die. No, I'm hoping they don't put that on us. Okay. The, um, I, I would say that um, there is a renewed emphasis in North Carolina on employment and in um, and, and all of the aspects of how to create employment opportunities for people with disabilities. And you'll see continued emphasis and much yeah. more public conversation about that and I think you'll see something else begin to shift the way we think about supportive employment. So I, I, I'm very comfortable with the employment. You know, we know that, that that's the goal of so many people. We can't accept a lot of people is that I don't ever want to be in a position to where uh, we choose, uh, you have to have supported employment or just stay at home with mom and dad. That's not the other option. Uh, that was an option given to a person who right. served. So we don't and want to do that. Mom and dad. What we want to do is make sure that we, we have a lot of options for people the goal being that anybody that wants to, to work, that that's a, a, a component of their, their belief, their person-centered plan, we want to support that effort every possible way that we can. Uh, case management is trickier, and, I, and I'll tell you it's trickier, and, and so my hesitation, as you might imagine, I used to work for an organization, did a lot of case management, and probably in, on a record in a lot of places, same things. Um, what I think we all know is that there are components that case managers did 
that are really important. Now, who does those and how they get done and how well they've been taken over by care coordination, how much providers are doing, those are real issues that we want to have this conversation about. That's part of this entire conversation. So I, what I'd say is that we want to hear what people say across the state before we come back with any kind of other proposals around that. Um, and, and, I, and I'm trying to, to frame it around what are those functions that we need in the system uh, that, that make it work and how and what does that look like so that we don't necessarily um, repeat something we've done previously but look forward and it's the best and that also goes beyond the innovations world because we have IPRS funding have nothing right. there, nothing at all thank you yes ma'am how much do you work with the school system if your goal is employment for people that should be happening starting at least at the high school level the, so, is there any interaction between your department and the school system? There is. There's a lot of interaction between DHHS and the <coughs> Department of Public Instruction. And, and I was telling you last night we had this exact same question, and, and I wish I had a better answer tonight than I did last night. Um, but the answer is, is that we haven't done enough, and, uh, and it's absolutely a key thing that we have to be much more aggressive about. One of the tricks, you know, we have get this wrong, but it's somewhere, it's above 100 school districts in North Carolina, um, beyond the number of counties that we have. So, so getting, every, every school district is different in how they think about transition, which is really the big question, how we do that transition. Um, so, unfortunately, I think our best bet is to work with the Department of Public Instruction, I didn't say it right, um, our best bet is to work with them to try to develop uh, more principles and how we all work together um, rather than trying to do it one school district at a time from the state level. We know at the LMEMCO level, different mm -hmm. MCOs do different work at that level. Some are really um, putting a lot of time and energy into it, others less because of priorities that are going there. But we recognize that's got to be, if we're, we're going to really achieve work, if we're really going to make a big difference in the employment side, we need to start as people are in high school in a transition. Have you considered working with the colleges? Um, and their education departments, because people can create and they can actually provide the time that local school districts might be needing in order to create changes in programs. It's a great idea, is that they have a very different relationship with schools to try to do that. I will tell you that we are beginning work around some things with community colleges and trying to, to rethink um, how, how the community colleges work with people with disabilities also um, in, in order to provide a more uh, clearer path to employment, but you know, it, it is, we have a lot to do, and that's one of those areas that we need to, but I think the points about employment and certainly the college will help us. Yes, ma'am. Um, and going with the college perspective, um, the governor said that, you know, there was um, programs that needed to be cut, and, and one of them was adult basic education, and so it's now under a different umbrella. And, you know, these, these young adults that have IDD, they need continuous education. They, they can't just be let go at 22 or 21 when they get out of school and say, okay, you're on your own. And the colleges <coughs> can do so much, but, I mean, they need, you know, life basic skills. And they have changed that. Um, the umbrella to that, like instead of basic skills, they need educational skills. Well, they do need educational skills, but when they're 22, 23, and 24, they need life skills. Yeah. They need to learn how, you know, to be able to look at a microwave and be able to cook something on their own instead of sitting at a table and trying to read a book that they've read when since kindergarten, you know, we need life skills um, in the, the colleges. Um, and also, you know, they, they don't retain like me or you. So they need repetitions, and they need to be able to have the life skills and retain it. And that's just not anywhere for somebody with IDD after you get out of school. At 21, it's just like, okay, you're done. Let's just sit at home and play games and, you know, and. I, I, would, I would say, I think, I think your points are well taken about face skills, but I'm going to look at Holly and, and know that 
Todd Riddle has, has been one of those people that have been a, a strong advocate over a career for post-secondary education for students with disabilities. And a lot of good stuff happened around the state at, at some really good universities that are yeah. um, really embracing people with disabilities on campus in these programs. And, and again, I think the community colleges, I'm not sure the governor did that actually, but the, what I would say is that I, I, the original comp ed program, which a lot of people talk about as the program that, that served a bunch of people with disabilities, was really a, it's a 30 year old lawsuit that brought that about. And, and, and I know people have done a lot of good work to try to change that comp ed program, but, but I think in, in many cases it became something that actually didn't promote a lot of um, change in people's lives and helping people do other things. It wound up being stale. And I think part of what we're trying to look at is how do you how do you change that idea of community college to shift it from uh, one that, that somebody would go through and spend the rest of their life in, in those top ed programs, to one that says we're going to try to teach skills so that people can, can uh, go to that or have other actions. And that's really what our, our goal is. Sandy Ellsworth, who works with our division, is doing a lot of work with um, Holly and others to try to, to, to promote that aspect. A lot of work to do, but uh, your comments in terms of what people need are absolutely. I will say that, um, I'm not sure who will go. I will say that that is captured with innovation flavors during our goals, but it would be, I think, an excellent component for it to be reinforced because repetition is important, but, but it is captured with that reinforcement because they do learn based through repetition. I'm going to just make sure there's nobody else that's ready to jump in before we go back. I just wanted to say one thing about um, some of the, some of the issues that have come up in terms of the loss of functions of case management, or even some of these due process issues. You know, not having someone to you know, assist families, but there there is a service that's part of the innovations way or and a new food service called Community Vibe that can be used to do that, and it's very underutilized. There are some LMDMCOs that utilize it, and others that really don't at all. And there's no state funding for it for people who don't have access to Medicaid funds. And that is something I think that could could influence, that could start tomorrow um, in terms of making some of those changes. Okay, I, I want to tag on to exactly that point. For community guide to work, you actually have to have something available in the community for these adults to, to do. And it's, it's uh, you know, incumbent on the managed care organizations to develop those resources, and that is simply not happening. That's why families want need to be paid as providers. Not only do they have a lack of in-home uh, people who can come to the home to provide services to do what we need to have done with our adults, but there's nothing available in the community. I, I really, I'd love to hear what it is, because I have explored it in this community, and it's not happening. Uh, at the same time, you know, we get told that, you know, our, our loved ones are not achieving their goals. Well, you have to have something to engage in to demonstrate your ability. I mean, that's, that's a system set up for failure from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first, ma'am, I want to talk about the um, changes coming for day program or day services. Can you speak a little bit about that? Is it, is it about home and community standards? Is that home and community standards? Is that I'm not quite sure what they labeled it as and what they're talking about. But. So let me... Let me I'll try this part and see if that's what we're talking about. There might be something else. But um, so, how are we doing on acronyms? First of all, are we doing okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Um, the, hey, appreciate it. The, uh, there are there are a whole bunch of things that are um, out there that are um, kind of kind of sort of sound alike and and uh, and a lot of uh, rumor and innuendo and other things that tie it. One of them is something called the Home and Community Based Standard Rules, which um, are CMS, which is the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, issued a set of rulings that said if you're going to use these um, waiver services, and, and, and maybe it's helpful just to remind people about waiver and how that came about. 
we talk about it all the time, like everybody like, knows it, but the waiver actually really is that. It's a waiver of uh, more restrictive rules. Um, the, the 1915C waiver, which is the CFAR of the BC, is a waiver of the um, intermediate care facility for people with IDD rules that allow for services to be provided in community settings. And that was the original um, sort of conversation. This actually happened under um, Ronald Reagan's um, original, uh, in his, I think it was his first term, when uh, he found somebody that was living in a nursing home, a young child, and uh, decided that that was the only place he could go because that was the only funding that was available. And so the only way he could come up with an answer was to waive <coughs> the nursing home rules law. So that's a long-winded explanation to try to avoid the acronym. So we say waiver. That's what we're talking about inside. Well, there've been there have, over the years. There's been a lot of a lot of conversation about are states using those waiver services intended not to be institutional or facility based in community settings, or are they using it in community settings? In fact, in North Carolina, when we last submitted the changes to our, in, what is now called the Innovations Waiver, um, CMS said, said feds, uh, you're using it in settings that are too big. Um, and we've been using it in adult care homes. And, uh, and there were large settings, and they said that's not the intention of this waiver. There are other things you can do to use that. Um, so. That's why we have the, the three bed uh, limits in terms of waiver services in group homes with the, the six bed um, uh, grandfather. So long story short, as CMS has sort of uh, talked about that, um, they, they have issued rules in January uh, that don't describe um, the actual size of the place to be. They describe no. the characteristics that they would expect the places <laughs> where this waiver service is funded in. And there are things like people should have an access to a kitchen. Uh, people should be able to lock their doors um, and, and do that. And mm -hmm. they should have access for people coming in. So you basically it's rights restrictions and then the ability to be in communities and not um, only in places where other people with disabilities live. So it, everybody, and all of the rules began talking about residential settings. <sighs> but in their rules, they also said these apply to vocational and day services. But they didn't give a lot of guidance about what they mean by this applies to vocational and day services. They said it would follow. Yeah. And then sometimes you think we're slow on things. You know, the feds can be a little bit slower than us no. in doing that. They're yeah. Kind of not quite sure when it's going to come out. Um, so they haven't given a lot of guidance, but they mm -hmm. have required that we submit plans in how to adhere to these rules. So we're kind of in that same dilemma of trying to figure out what this really means. Uh, we'll be working on that over the next several months. And in fact, you know, we're welcoming comments here about what do you think we should be doing in those plans. But that's probably what you're hearing is people talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, there also is, at the federal level, a real strong push, and, and maybe something's passed now, but to eliminate subminimum wage um, for folks. And, and, and you know that the Office of Civil Rights has joined in litigation against one one city, Rhode Island, uh, in Rhode Island, Providence, um, about sheltered workshops um, to break those up. And there's some uh, effort in Washington State, I've got the other state that's involved in. But all I have to say is that um, we, we as a state don't have the guidance yet from CMS on exactly what that means, but we know we're going to have to address it, and we will be engaging all of you to help us address it. With the services that have a group service definition there, <laughs> and the statement that are in the um, innovation manual to say that there's a group service definition, a uh, service code, then services <coughs> should be looked at to provide group. Sometimes there's a conflict when um, services are authorized or proposed that services should go to group. When we're talking about support and employment, we're talking about they, you know, all types of groups. Sport and employment is the biggest one. So some, what I'm saying is... Are you really we can look what ourselves? Yes. Yeah. So I think that's something that we need to That's really helpful. That is. Um, so I have several questions, but let's share them. Thank you. What did you say? an easy one. Can we turn the air up a little? Oh, man, can we turn the air up and tell you that? <laughs> 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 no, 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 you should. So we have it right. Only if there's a virus
Um, has there been any mention for residential providers? Um, they've lost the ability to utilize true respite. There has been an accommodation, a $5 a day per diem or whatever. Um, again, best practice, everyone has seen that the purpose of respite is to give the primary caregiver a break. What makes an AFL provider or a group home provider or someone not the primary caregiver? Can I follow up on that? That's my soapbox issue. <coughs> I work with families as a QP. Um, it seems like a grave injustice. Uh, innovations uh, assigning a group home service to individual homes. What's going on? Um, they're not group homes. These are people's homes. Um, they've assigned a group home service which comes with a bunch of limitations, takes away respite. These folks, these families have this person that they've taken in 24-7 and they've taken away respite. That's a huge robbery. Yeah. It's just wrong. Five dollars a day doesn't touch it. That's a cool joke. I'll tell you, if you, you won't be shocked to know uh, that last night we had the same conversation. Uh, and I think, I think we heard the same compelling conversation is that um, we have to think about how, how, how best to make sure that we're doing what's right for the individual and the person who's taking care of us. So the solution actually came before innovations. It was called Home Sports. It was there. It took so long to get it, and then it was taken away. That broke the down. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, you're cutting the parents hours, but there's no staff available to help you. And I had a person to tell me from an agency, they interviewed six people and they all had criminal records. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they can't provide people to help you. <coughs> so, I don't understand when the client wants to stay in the home, why this is happening to people that are loving and caring and that give their child a bath every day when AFLs that I know of may do it twice a week. And I just had my daughter at the dentist the other week and she made a comment about, does she not have hair on her legs? And I said, yes, she does. And she said, I said, I shave them. She said, I have caregivers that bring these clients in here because they do people with handicaps at this dentist's office that don't even brush their teeth. Mm -hmm. So who wants their child to have that kind of care? And I worked for 30 years, and the reason I stopped working it's because the people that were supposed to pick my daughter up would call me 10 minutes before time to pick her up and say, I can't make it today. I'd go pick her up, bring her to my office, or my husband would pick her up and take her to his office because people do not show up. And then when they do show up, many times she had messed in her pants, and she doesn't do that. She doesn't wear a diaper. She goes to the bathroom, but I didn't have time to take her to the bathroom. She's caring for her, but she didn't have time. That's the reason I had to quit work, because my job was in jeopardy after I had to keep getting off and getting off and getting off and getting off from work. I appreciate you That is the honest truth. You can check my record. And I think these, um, like you're talking about the group home situation on an individual basis, each client should be reviewed on an individual basis. And I know the case managers are supposed to do that. But there's people getting services that I'm sure some of them don't need all of them. There's more that needs more that's not getting them. I, I appreciate your comments. And I want to say, you, you might imagine that the thing that we know in these conversations we're going to have across the state, one of the more controversial issues would be about families and providers and how do we deal with that going forward. And that's just a, it's a reality. It's been that way for a while. Um, what, what we want to do is we want to hear from people. We want to hear what people have to say, and that's part of the reason why we're out doing this. I don't think there's a pre preconceived notion of what the long-term answer is that from the state. And you probably also know this, that there's a legislature that we're looking at this. Yeah. I don't think that legislature can make any significant um, decision on that either, because it's complicated. It's very difficult. And I think we understand clearly that there are really, and I want to say that there are some incredibly 
caring, gifted uh, direct support workers that do a great job. And I want to do not disparage everybody that does that work, because then we'll have less people like that work. Uh, we also know that there are people that, because they have other things that, in their lives, and we don't pay a whole bunch of money to do that work, that wind up get distracted and aren't the best person they have at home. We understand that, too. So there's some balance that we've got to figure out. And we want to work with families and work with our system to make sure that we do that in the right way. So appreciate you bringing it up. I just wanted to make sure we have a broader comment on that. Can I just add something to that, Dave, that the, the rules and the innovations waiver that address that, or how or how that's supposed to be thought about by the, by the LME, LME and NCO, are vague and subjective. And it requires the MCO to make a value judgment about one person's family member's relationship with another member of their family. And so if it's going to be revised, and it needs to be, I'm not saying I know what it needs to be, but that it should be something clear, something more clear. I don't know what that is, but something more clear. And again, they can't assess that by a three-page application part A, B, or C. Um, you can't truly assess um, a family member's abilities to support other individuals by just a paper application. No. That's just too much work, isn't it? Okay, and, and to tag along with that, as a, as a provider, I have several family members who serve as direct service employees, and I have to say, you know, I do agree that there, there needs to be some governance there. there. There are cases where, you know, there could be some abuse of that privilege, but I have to say that the folks that we submit those applications for are the best workers I have. Yeah. Yes. Those people go above and beyond exactly. to expose their children to things that other yes, workers would not want to do because they value the quality of life of that exactly. individual more than anybody else ever will. Um, and so it, 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 it seems shameful that they have to fight to be able to continue to provide person-centered care which is supposed to be the goal of the system. Mm -hmm. But I have I have parents who not only work with their children, but who find I find going to school so that their children can actually participate in the field trips yeah. on top of it because the people at the school will just leave them sitting in the corner because they're too exactly. much work. Mm -hmm. You know, th there, there's too much of that across the system. And if you want to give me the other responsibilities, then let me as the provider you know, I'm supposed to monitor that anyway, and there's a lot of duplication over that. I go out every month, somebody else comes out every month, not sure why that is. Oh. You know, the checklist that I go by is very vague and doesn't mm -hmm. even apply to stuff in the home. It says home checklist, and that's the only thing about the home that's on the checklist is the title. Um, so I'm looking at other stuff that I look at every month that I could really evaluate anywhere. I, I do agree that something needs to be in place to make sure it's not there just because I, I want to earn the money and I'm, I'm keeping the person sheltered and I'm not. But as a provider, I have a vested interest in making sure that that's not happening. So I agree that some of those things need to be done, but I think there's a lot of waste in that. It wastes a lot of my time to have to fight over and over for these people every year. I don't know what's mm -hmm. supposed to change so drastically, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. you know, from, from year to the year and, and why there's so much confusion um, around that. But those are the best workers I have. Yeah. You know, those aren't the people that are trying to, to police the system. I, you know, and, and they, they want them to succeed. They want them to do yeah. well. And on another note, the whole thing of someone else mentioned about the progress and, and people not meeting goals. I'm having a real problem with those things being used to decrease people's services. Yes. Yes. Here again, oh, we said excellent that point. things shouldn't be based on the recovery model for DD. So does it mean that they don't deserve the services because on this set of goals for this set of time, they didn't make a certain set of percentage? And who's deciding what, mm -hmm. what, what percentage they need to be at for it that to be considered a service that is that they're benefiting from? To me, it's a success that they are they're being maintained in their home. They're they're getting you know they're getting things out of life that they might not 
get otherwise. I don't want to see more personal care hours for somebody just to sit and look at them and, and watch them wither away. I would rather continue to invest in training because that's valuable to them. They need that for retention just because they may not progress at the rate that somebody else does or meet 100% of their on uh, their goals. They're not going to they're not going to grow out of it. Exactly. But that doesn't mean they don't, they're not benefiting from it and it's not adding to their quality of life. So I, I, I have a huge problem with that, and I think that's something that really needs to be addressed because that's what I'm being told. Well, they didn't meet, but 50% on the goals are, you know, so then you, you, you feel like people need to, you feel like you're sending the people the messages, but you better show that they're making those goals. I want people to reflect what's going on honestly and accurately. Yes. And yes, we exactly. use that as a tool to adjust the goals, but then that comes against you too, where you just increase the prompts or you, you know, you, you did this or you did that, but they're not benefiting from the service because they're, they aren't at a certain percentage. But they I don't mean, know what type of day that person's right, having. Right, and these are people that, that don't even know the people. Seizure. They've had a seizure. They've had yes. something okay. Okay. Yeah, I agree with all their, their add-ins, but yeah, and we do try to reflect that, you know, yeah, they were having a bad month, but I don't see that coming back on the notes for why it got decreased, you know, or, you know, give me a chance right now. I know I sent you those last uh, quarterly reports, but um, she's got some assistive technology that's really helping her, and she's really making some progress, and she's excited, and she, she can use a communication device better. Well, tough look, see if you can do it with 10 hours instead of 20 exactly. a week now. Exactly. I mean, exactly. that's, that's a huge, huge issue, and people, they shouldn't have to fight for their services like exactly. that, just to, you know, I, I, they're valuable. I think that captured it all, and Okay, I have on that issue of the not meeting goals and the services being cut, the LMEMCOs are trying to impose a rehabilitation definition, not a habilitation definition. And these families, these providers need to file appeals and be very clear about what the definition of habilitation is. It's in North Carolina statute and it is not to show progress. That's not the definition of habilitation. Skill building is, is a habilitate. There is no service that is rehabilitative on this waiver. So these LME MCOs are up to no good, and you know it. The second thing I want to talk about is the families who aren't approved to work more than 40 hours. And I have contacted all of the LME MCOs and asked for their statistics. So far, I have received Partners, and I have received Smokey, and I have received Sandhills. In fact, Smokey volunteered them. And Smokey and Sandhills have about a 25% of the relatives as direct service employees who are doing more than 40 hours. Partners has 8%, and there's one guy that approves the applications. One guy. Used to be a committee, but you all decided it was an administrative function, so they, got away, they did away with their committee. The second thing is, for those plans that are more than 40 hours, and the relative hasn't been approved to work more than 40 hours, and no worker shows up, what is it you expect the families to do with that individual? As legal guardian, am I supposed to go drop the individual off at DSS, at the LMEMCO, at the Sheriff's Department, at the emergency room? What am I supposed to do? It's not, if there's no staff, there's no staff. You need to tell us. The LMEs just sort of sit there dumbfounded. The service providers could file appeals, but they're not going to do it because it's a closed provider network. We can't file an appeal. And the final statement on that, there's an organization called Consumer Voice. And it was founded by individuals in nursing homes. And over the course of time, it's a national organization, they have come to represent everyone. And they have a specific page for home and community-based services. Well, they submitted a report to Congress, and one of the things they asked in that was that um, the federal government tell the states 
to require that consumers have the right to choose their workers and schedules for care and services. And here is their clarifying statement. You'll appreciate this. Consumers were very clear that they wanted a say in who their worker is and when their services are provided. These choices are fundamental to person-centered care. Allowing consumers the choices in these areas makes care and services more responsive to consumer needs and improves not only quality of care but quality of life as well. Without these choices, we are in essence, quote, institutionalizing, end quote, people in their own homes. Stop putting limits on families, relatives. Us baby boomers are going to go away. Mary's very passionate about this. Mary and I have known each other for a long time, and uh, we've had a lot of debates on these things, and I'm sure we won't agree on lots of things. What I'll say is I don't think there's anybody at the state, and I don't believe there's anybody on the LCO um, that wants to deny people from having the right kinds of services. But that's not true. That's not true. Dave, you have to listen. It's not true. what we're saying. <laughs> okay, and I tell you, it was fair game to yell at me, that's okay. But, but I also think it would be fair to give me a shot to, to finish the statement. So, the, the thing where I'm trying to go to this is that, so a statistic, 25 versus 8, and if you don't know the rest of them, it probably doesn't tell you the whole story, right? So that's fair. Um, but what is the right number? Do you know? It's ho however many want to do more than 40, however many, the, and, it's a, and it is individual. That's right. And if there is no staff, there is no staff. I'm not disagreeing with that, Mary. What I'm saying is that you also, I think there's a fairness that you have to give to the people that are trying to manage the system also. And, and I think what you have to... But the service plan is the service plan. The service plan is the service plan, and the amount of money that they have to manage the system is the amount of money they have to manage the system. And I'm not suggesting to you that that's, that's the only thing that people are doing, but there is the reality that we don't have all the money in the world. And so the question, and, and it was we'll a legitimate question from me to you, is that what do you, what do you think is the right number or percentage? If, if you're going to look at all of the LMEMCOs, and I'm not asking you to do this rhetorical in that sense, but if you look at all the LMEMCOs, you look across the country and say, so what, what would give you comfort that we're at the right level of people providing more than 40 hours. When we had home supports, there were 1,091 individuals who were billing home supports. That's from the appendix of the waiver document, appendix J, the cost neutrality document. So there were, in the whole state, out of 12,000 individuals on the waiver, there were 1,091 relatives providing services. So you seem to think that it's some overwhelming number of, of relatives who, who are, are requesting to provide this service because there's no staff. If you stop picking on us, we'll work with you to try to fix the system. Well, the difference? Yeah, there, me, there, me, there is none. No, there is none. That's where it comes in. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I was just trying to raise the question of what do you think that number is the right number? If that was the whole point. Is that somewhere... I thought you were getting the point. You think there is some percentage that is the right percentage? That's one. So okay. There is a right percentage. A hundred. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, you have to be a parent sometime. We, we, realize we are. That there's a limit amount. More hours in the week than no, 40. Well, and too. more hours in the week, okay. yeah. I am too. But yeah. the problem is the, the system that the state is set up, the way I understand it, is the NCOs get X amount of dollars. And their salaries, their vacation pay, all of that comes out of that part of money. Bonus. <laughs> and I, I want to ask the here. I'll put you on the spot. Have y'all, you know, there's a tremendous amount I, I of would, services. I would really rather. Okay. Well, we asked at the beginning, and I'm going to kind of hold that to you. You can beat up on me. Let's not try to beat up on anybody. Else. We shouldn't beat up on anybody. This is part of the process of everybody working together so, and working their opinions. So let's, let's just have. We're not going to do that at all. But in the context of what we were saying, though, whether the family member does the service or someone else, it doesn't cost any more. Exactly. That person is authorized for a certain number exactly. of hours. I don't know why it 
you know, why it matters. It's not going to cost the NCO anything extra for the family member to go before. It, it will cost the provider. It's the same the money. They have to pay time and a half, you know, for yeah. overtime. But if they're willing to submit cover. the application, you know, for them to do it, then they stand behind that family member doing it. And, you know, that's up to them if they want to take that on. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm a, a father of a handicapped child. A uh, very sweet young boy, and I found out here just recently that, uh, well, uh, I can't work with my son, but if I move out of my house, I can work with my son. You can son. do the other 40 hours. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's another good point. If we don't live with them, then we're not reviewed. Yeah. That makes no sense to me. So Deb is going to talk to no, no, as far as parents go, uh, parents, step parents, adoptive parents, whether you're in the home or not, that. That's oh, that's not what the waiver says. No, 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 Deb. Nice try. That you can't do that. Why is it combined to of 40 hours? NCO is pushing to Living with only. One parent. Yes. He was told if he moved out of the house, he could do the other 40 hours. That's how it's, it's working. Okay. Yep. It's yep. a combined, they, they live pushing, in the same house. It's the combined hours, hours of everybody that lives in the house. Now, whether or not they are correct in the way they're executing it, I don't know, but that's what I'm really good at encourage folks a couple of things. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's yeah. serious. Is that, you can yeah. yelling at us is probably not going to get your point across <laughs> any better. And, and, I'm, and I'm serious. I, I, I don't think we want to do that to each other. I think an honest conversation, I think we heard you. Is that what you're saying is that the, the idea that if you wanted two parents together and somebody was going to provide more hours, that 40 was the total amount that could be provided. <laughs> and it's ridiculous. I mean, watch, I don't understand why it would be different for a typical family. Typical family, both parents take care of the child. I think, I think, then Deb's got it written down. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's what I don't understand. I, but that puts single parents at a disadvantage. So the point is not to put anything on the parents. I'm sitting here tonight and, you know, hearing, uh, especially in the past few moments, uh, the conversations and the remarks made. Um, two years ago, families received a sign of hope because of different appointments that were made within the state, within the Department of Health and Human Services. Families at that particular time were feeling very low. There were new appointments. There were new things coming out. There were, there were these focus study groups. And families truly, truly felt that there was hope. And mm -hmm. sadly, that has not what has <laughs> happened. And what I am seeing and feeling here is <clears throat> the families have lost that hope. Um, the families feel as though it's no longer Department of Health and Human Services. It is the MCOs that are fully controlling the system. It's the MCO that is fully controlling what is going on in each and every home. And when families try to contact Raleigh, when they try to get additional information or to get help, it's not coming back from Raleigh. And I, I really feel um, that Raleigh needs to show the families that they can have faith that Raleigh is going to do right by the families. Because when you get down to it, Dave, this is what this is all about. It's about families. It's not about the MCOs. It is about the families. The MCOs are there to be able to provide the services for these families. Yet they are more concerned with their budgets. Yes, I understand there are budgets, but when we see over and over again particular families being hit, I mean, Dave, we are living it. We are living it. And again, I'm going <clears> to. <throat> 
I'll try to wade into this thing again. And, uh, the reason why we're here, the reason why we're going out and doing this, is to hear what people have to say. And one of the things I started out with is, is asking that we would keep it about what what the system should look like, not about what individual people have done. And I, I'll absolutely tell you, that I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I'm confident that today five or six mistakes that were significant before I walked into the um, Some of that may have been not, not hearing what somebody said the right way and dealing with that. And I think everybody in here has done that. I, I do disagree. I don't think there's a soul that works in these programs that wants to do any damage to what people do. People are trying to do their jobs. I know. They're trying to do the jobs the best they can. I and maybe our system design may not be the right way it should be designed. And I think, to me, that's what I think we, when we filter out some of the comments that people have said, that's what I think, is that there are some design things that we have to really think about. Now, I said at the very beginning, there's some things we'll be able to do, others we won't be able to do, but we'll be real honest about that when we can and can. Um, and we'll try to ferret out the difference between personality and what system should look like. Because, frankly, it shouldn't matter the personality. It ought to be that a system works, and it works no matter who's in those places. And that's what we're trying to achieve. I, I understand the passion, and I understand people being upset, and I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't be. But I am suggesting it's a heck of a lot easier to have a conversation about how a system should look like and if we respect the fact that everybody's trying to do the best for what they, they, they can. And it may not be what I want, or what you want, or somebody else wants. But they're trying to do their job. They're well, it will never be a perfect system. And yes, looking forward is great. Uh, and that is what needs to be done. But at the same time, today, things are failing and families are falling apart. And by the time we get to when the next waiver is implemented, those families are going to be completely dismantled. Yeah. I, think, I think we've heard that a lot. So, so we're going to shift a couple people back, and we'll come back to people up here, maybe. Yes, ma'am. Just to continue with the theme, have you considered asking a university, surely there must be a doctoral student in social work or something, who would like to research the family experiences of family providers, and so that you have the documentation that you need to go say, maybe we need more money? But it would help, you know, here's the reality. Family providers are probably the cheapest you can get. And you might be able to cut them a little bit because they already have the commitment. And, uh, and they've already been living there. are already lots of studies. It's interesting to hear from some of these people the same experiences that I've been through. This just exhausted me, and you have no trust that last year I might have spent training with two, four, or five people in one year. Actually, in fewer months, um, and that never showed up again. They don't even call it. They don't show. And I think maybe people need to understand that at that, with low pay and no benefits, people can't make a career decision to take care of my son. You know, they need to do the smarter choice. And a lot of people who do speak with them are really using it as a stepping stone to go to nursing school or something. They're using that income. So it's a given, they're leaving. Their plan is to leave when they start. But I think some of the research is to actually get some numbers. There is so research. You can go to Congress and say, this is what the reality is of it. Another issue is, this is our punishment for institutions, group homes, separate schools, separate classrooms, mm -hmm. because we aren't raising the children without disabilities figure out how to live with the children with disabilities. Very well said. So we really need to get inclusion in the schools. You know, you can't start my son at 41 trying to make him more flexible. That should have been happening yeah. in school, and then we should have continued. You don't get more no, flexible. don't use common sense. <laughs> or 51, or 61. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate those. are really
The B3 supported employment definition because it has a significant drop off, right? Yes. And so talking about habilitative versus rehabilitative, that's really a, um, do these folks rehabilitate by the third quarter of employment with B3 Medicaid? Or is that a philosophy that if you don't fit into that that uh, degree of that support, you don't get, you don't need that service? You know? Um, I would, I think there are I mm -hmm. think folks who can work, but they may continue to need more services. Than that. So, so the B3 service definition is too too less from ten a week to ten a month. I think that's yeah. yeah, I think would that be a fair assessment? And that, that we should go it look needs back. Needs to be individualized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. yes. That's very helpful. Thank you. So, <laughs> Yesterday, right now. Yeah. 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 Send him your bill for consultation. Um, my concern is that and I hear the passion of the parents speaking on behalf of their children and wanting what's best for their children and that kind of thing. And I support that 100%. But on the flip side of that, my concern is the, the support of the providers and the day programs and the support services out there for their children. Mm -hmm. And to me, when you go back and you discuss these things, it's just as important to me that there's that side of the, the coin represented as well. I mean, I, I, I completely believe 100% in the passion and the support for the families, and they need that. But on the flip side, we're out there too, and some of these families need us as well. So it's important to me that that flip side of the coin is, is discussed and presented, you know, when you go back and you look at report and changing things and trying to make them to everybody. So I, I just appreciate the effort to make this board. I just wanted to ask, it's, it's more of a procedural kind of thing because I'm learning about the waiver and I'm new to the waiver. Our family is new to the waiver. And I wanted to, to follow up on something that you said. Um, was that I'm just trying to understand because what I've experienced in the one year that we've been on the innovations waiver had never been on the CAP waiver, did not have services, we were on the wait list, is that the care coordinator is not exactly doing case management. We did have our prior to that being changed. <laughs> as a case manager. Before we had the data, we did have our as a case, uh, a case worker there. But um, our care coordinator is is in some ways acting as a case, it, our experience has been as a case manager to kind of help guide us. And what you said, I just wanted to, to kind of, I don't know your name, but uh, Duncan, um, you, you mentioned that um, an underutilized aspect is the community guide as an advocate. And my question is this, because I don't understand it. If a family is in an appeal situation, is there time for them to activate in some way a separate person that's a community guide as an advocate? I, I don't understand that a at all. A community guide can help with that. And actually, I I work for the Ark of North Carolina. Okay. And I'll say that we provide, we do provide that service. And we have used that service in those situations during an appeal. The, the, the issue is that when you have your appeal, if that's not in place, if you're on the innovations waiver, then your care coordinator has to update your plan and get that approved in. Your appeal process might be over before that happens. That was my question. Because when you said it, I was like, well, there's timelines on the appeals mm -hmm. process, so it might be out of that window by the time. So that that just my question. I was like, I don't even see how that would work. But it, it could help with that. It could also help with in situations with people who, who are on a waiting list and have no service, <laughs> but they might at least be able to access some community resources, some yes. someone to help guide them as they if they've never had a service before, been on the way around. Yes. What to expect. And that would be under B3 mm -hmm. services, the community guide. For people who have community guide. Yeah. Or excuse me, who have Medicaid. Yeah, but, but don't have the waiver. 
but they, okay. I just, you know, that's pretty good. You actually learned a lot. I understand how that all goes together. I thought would be helpful to families. That's very good. I sure don't understand it. Thank you. So we're going to go, Randy, you're stuck, and we'll come back here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I want to go back to, I know that we have had this conversation quite a few times, and uh, it's about the flexibility of providing services to the NCOs. The flexibility, are, are there going to be some kind of tighter guidelines so that all of the NCOs, LMEs, provide these services in the same manner. I know there needs to be some flexibility, I understand that. But the amount of flexibility now is so outrageous that, I mean, they're, they're just all over the chart. As, as like one NCO LME will determine that this service is provided this way, another one is completely 360 degrees the opposite direction. You know, families don't, they don't, they can't communicate with each other yeah. because they can't, they have no guideline to go by statewide as far as their NCOs providing services. Does, does that make sense? It does make sense. I, I don't I turn it into what I think you're suggesting and you didn't try it that way. Is that you're suggesting going forward that there has to be a framework that is consistent across all of the MCOs, but allow within that the flexibility to provide not too much more individuals. Well, and, and, I, and, I, and I don't want to challenge you on that, and not too much stuff, because I think when you talk about, when I talk about frameworks, the frameworks means that, you know, so we're going to do business in this way, and that's how everybody does business. But I'm not so sure. This is a question that's sort of what we want to hear from people. I'm not so sure you want the state to be so rigid with the manager at that level that they have no flexibility to, because that flexibility you may want, you may stop them from doing. Well, the advantage of having local systems is people can can sort of adjust to what local needs. I, I like the, the flexibility. I, I I do understand that there is a need for it, but I think that the amount of flexibility that you 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 allow them to go by is damaged as a whole. You know, I, I, I understand that there needs to be flexibility, and there should be some flexibility. But it should not, they should not have enough flexibility to determine their own manner of dispensing these services, no matter, just because of the word flexibility. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? What you're saying is that the framework has to be consistent. It has to be shrunk a little bit to where where they, everybody has to go by the same guidelines, you know, basic guidelines. And, I don't, and, and I'm saying this again. I, I don't know if I'm I wouldn't do that, but I don't think that's inconsistent with what the LME MCOs are telling us. Is that they want that for our framework that allows them to work within it, with the acknowledgement that, that to meet local needs, they're going to adjust those things. And I think that's. That's what we're trying to get to. I, I think we all know we, that we weren't, we're not there now, we weren't there before. So, it's just reality. Okay, well, what's do, uh, when the managed care organizations manage and, and operate their own dollars, what's to prevent, you know, who, who oversees how those dollars are being utilized? I, don't, I mean, that that is a, 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 a critical component because I think you know, the last time I looked at a spreadsheet, and I had to find it, and I dug for it, all the managed care organizations' administrative costs exceed or meet at least 30% of their overall budget while they're cutting services. I, I, I would say to you that's not true. Well, uh, please not. show me where the evidence is. We, we need we, to see it, and I think, I think the taxpayers are that. We can certainly do that, but that is not accurate. Um, I, on her note, um, I can, I'm on seat back for Smokey, and we get a monthly um, report, and we see, and we get a yearly report, and we are, they're also a budget of her, they're, I don't know, budget of the report, but they have a company that comes in behind them and make sure that they're not the CEC and they give if you join the CPAC they will give you 
any report you ask for at that moment, it's all on their website. It's all on, you know, you can find it. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, they do oh. try to make sure that it's available to whoever needs it. And I will say that's true for Smokey. It's not true for partners. You're 100% accurate. Mary, I, I really appreciate mm -hmm. what people have a different kind of... Like, Trying to tell you the difference between the MCOs, the, um, Dave. What I would take away from this, and I think that would that probably be the right, is that um, if people have a perception that there's some 30% administrative cost, then we're not doing a good job that we have to make sure that that is easier for you to find and see and understand what those costs are. But I, 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 there is there is no LMEMCO that are at 30 percent administrative costs. Absolutely. Not. David, in the revision that's come about, you spoke about in the period of time. Can you reflect on some of the things that the provider can expect to see, and maybe as a reflection on the service? Well, that's a great point. I'm sorry, I did not get the question. What he asked is that, so as we're thinking through this, what, what should people expect to see? Providers in particular is possible. And, and so, first of all, I'll say is that, although we have we have some ideas that we kind of threw out in the very beginning about what we believe the system ought to look like, one of the ways that we're going to do this is listen to what people said. And I think, I think what you'll see is that we have a real commitment to regulatory reduction on the provider side, is that we know that there is a... Um, that we duplicate a lot of things, especially if you wind up doing business in more than one element of MCO, is that we've got to we've got to reduce that. We have to re reduce the cost of board, because some of the things just are too expensive for us to, to do. We have to think that through. So you'll, you'll see that effort. It's ongoing now. It's going to continue to go forward. I believe that we'll see is that we will go to an individual budget um, system, so that in the innovations waiver, that, that provides a consistency. Uh, that people will know in the future. I, I heard very clearly what people say, and I think we've heard it, is that, that, that we said it in the very front. We don't want a, a rehab model within the innovation service. We want a support model that includes habilitation in it. Um, and one of the best ways to assure that you don't have this sort of um, bench that says you're not meeting certain goals is to create an individual budget process that we all know, that we all agree upon, and that's a consistent number that people can be in. I think it helps providers. Like it helps families, and it certainly helps um, the system understand what the future looks like. I think we're looking for a lot of, you know, suggestions. Well, we, I, I said this in another meeting. I'm reluctant to say it the way I did previously, but I believe is we want to create services that are as flexible as possible. That um, you know, if, if it were up to me, the best way to do it is you do a person-centered plan, and if that person-centered plan said. You know, for, for Duncan, this is what it should be. That should be the service definition. That person's at a plan. CMS isn't going to let us do that. That's not any any chance in the world. But that's where we ought to be headed to, is that those persons at a plans drive that. But it's got to be within a logical approach on how we choose, how we make decisions on what the budget is. And, you know, the equity question is really important. That's why we will be looking at that, that effort to get to that point. We, we spent about an hour on the services done by the mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. everybody's kind of pulling your thread and hoping that something's going to come about and change is going to be positive in this regard. Uh, can you reassure, I guess, that you're going to take these things forward? And I don't know what kind of influence you have mm -hmm. uh, making changes. <laughs> Good point. You can see who's on the road. Find out right now. So I. Let me say it this way, is that um, Deb yes, sir. other folks that are with our team and that are part of this effort, uh, the choice to come out on the road and have these conversations was not something that CMS would have required us to do this way. Fire, fire. And so, so our, our commitment is that, and what I'd say, this is me personally, it would be a, it would be a doggone shame, I'll say it that way, I would use the other words without uh, Mary's camera, but a doggone shame, uh, that we would um, that, that we would spend all this time and hear what people have to say and not use it. That would be dumb. I mean, I, I, and I, I believe this, and I do believe it, and I know Deb and, and our team and the DMH and, and believes that the answer doesn't lie in our buildings in Raleigh. The answers lie in these conversations, and, they, and that's where innovation takes place, that's where people 
tell us things we haven't heard and we do that. Again, the parameters are we work in a where we have to follow CMS rules. Uh, we have budget constraints that everybody knows that we have and that's a it's way in a different place and our, our, our legislator will have an opportunity to, to talk about those things that go forward. But our goal is is that we're going to make the system better. I mean, the secretary's admonition to me is that, you know, we need to support people and we need to do the right thing. And within the constraints that we all face, that's what we're going to try to do. So I don't, I don't think that answers it. Do I know how much we can do? But, but we're not out here doing this because it, um, that, that we, we, we're out here doing it because we believe this is the right way to do it. And the only way to do that is to take the information back and try to make that work. From a system design going forward. Let her ask the question. Thank you. Um, there are a few pieces to, this, to these questions, actually, and I'll try to be very, I shall be brief. Um, I just want to state that I have really grave concerns about this hub process that's being driven by partners and certainly by the environment, uh, the managed care environment. They're kind of throwaway sentences that there is a place for. Uh, the IED population in these hubs, but you know what? I don't think so. They're looking for behavioral uh, health, mental health, well, same, and substance abuse, and then if they're lucky, they've got some medical in there and prescribers in there. But there really is no place that I can envision in these hubs on which millions of dollars yeah. are being spent or will be spent. So that is just a statement. Yeah. Um, not too many years ago, Dave, you were a featured speaker at NC Cash to discuss the 1915 BC waiver, which was a done deal by then, or almost this close to being a done deal. Um, you have a history and reputation of being a very effective lobbyist with the ARC and for the ARC. Um, a couple of the deals that you've been able to negotiate with the legislators, the legislators in this 1915 waiver was the promise, and that is the word you used, the promise of any um, profits going back into IDD funding. You really worked hard and successfully got that. And I'm sure there were other lobbyists and other people involved, um, but the ARC was important in making that happen. Another thing was the promise that the people making decisions about the IDD population of people receiving services would be competent, have knowledge and experience in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities. Do you believe the promise of getting the monies back into the system has shown to be true, I believe. But do you believe the promise of assuring that staff having any decision making, staff who work for an NCO, are specialists experienced in IDD? Or are they still working on a recovery model? I think that's mixed. I think that's the answer, the best answer to say. And, and so I, I know about the hub model that Congress is proposing. And, and, and look, well, let me say, and from the standpoint of, from the mental health and substance use priorities, what they're trying to do are absolutely consistent with what we believe should be happening in that system. I happen to believe you can't run an IDD system the same way you run a mental health and substance use system. And that if we tried to do that, then we would be wrong because they require very different supports and services. Now, we have to have an ability for people who want to have intellectual disabilities to access mental health services the same way that, that you know, we should not limit people from going across those and we need to integrate much more our medical services with our um, and our long-term supports and that's part of the governor's plan and we're trying to push, and so I won't do that commercial yet, but that's uh, something we really want people to think about. But every MCO is different at where they're at in terms of <coughs> what they're doing around the IGD <coughs> population. What I can tell you is that there is absolutely no wavering from the state's commitment that IDD services are based upon a different model. And that's a support model that has habilitation in it. It's not a recovery-based model. And then we say it everywhere we go. Every one of our staff says that everywhere we go. <coughs> and we say that clearly to LME and CEOs. Um, are, we, are, we, are we there yet? No. 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 
not being actualized necessarily. And, and I, think, I, think, I think that what your comments are so important mm -hmm. here, and I want to say that because, again, you know, we're, we're, we're having these conversations with LME MCOs, and, and I'm not, and I say this with all sincerity, I don't think there's, there's not one CEO of those organizations that doesn't believe services for IVD are really important. They may have put more concentration somewhere else uh, because that's what took their attention immediately, or that's what their background was. But in every one of those organizations, and there are several of those people here now, they have people that are in leadership roles that are absolutely IDD um, experts. And that's, that's a really important thing to know, in that those folks did stay with those organizations, and they're still there. So, so I think, like anything else, we're not there. Um, our goal was to continue to improve the system yeah, that's why we're out. We want to hear what you have to say. Can I get a couple more in, too? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Back to the due process. Yeah, that's, that's, um, we discussed at that same conference due process because disability rights and resources was there, uh, talking about concerns with the MCO model and due process. And then when I just think of small pieces of due process, the, the, the team or, or the, the, the people making a decision to either deny hours, deny service, reduce hours, whatever decision they are making. So they've made a decision, and any reconsideration is brought before those exact same people. And having made the original decision, they have a vested interest in supporting, oh, well, we made the right decision. I'm not saying this is what happens. I haven't been present for that. But I know when challenged that you've made, a, you've talked about making five wrong decisions today, or, you know, when challenged, oh, this is a wrong decision, this is why we need this amount of support. Well, it's the same people that made the original decision. They don't have a vested interest in agreeing. So even at the very beginning of due process, there's a, a seeming non-transparent, non-equitable piece to it from the get-go when you have to bring a case before the same people who made the original decision. Yeah, I think those are <coughs> and it's a, it's a due process and issue. You have to have some, uh, you do in the reconsideration process the same doctor uh, or uh, PhD level psychologist <coughs> cannot make the reconsideration decision. There has to be two separate individuals. Um, but who pays that person? <laughs> the MCO. This is the original step. What? And I'm, I'm not sure doctors are... I get your point. Licenses. Doctoral level psychologists are present for a reconsideration. Uh, you cannot have a denial done by someone who's less than a, a licensed psychologist or... How about a reduction in services? It's the same. The, the level, it has to go through a doc before mm -hmm. it is denied. <laughs> so one of the things that... I have one comment about this. Before we do that, let me just say what, part of what I think we want to write down yeah. is that it, it's really important that everybody has the same information we about... Need edu we need, edu we need um, we're having, we have due process training for staff, but I think maybe we need due process training for everybody. Yes. I have a question. So if somebody will just second that, I'll write it down. If you, yeah, have, if you have a doctor, a, a psychiatrist... Yes board certified, all that good stuff, or a doctoral level psychologist making a decision who does not have expertise in IDD, can the person making the appeal appeal the person who's made the decision? Because they're, in psychiatry, um, people who specialize in child psychiatry, ergo I can do adults with IDD because they're all just children, you know. <laughs> I've heard that. In court. Unfortunately, you'll run across that every so often, but my experience in doing the annual reviews of the MCOs is that they have not only docs who are specialized in children and adults, but they have IDD, mental health, and substance abuse backgrounds. Do you have anybody like board certified? It's someone board certified in working with children as a, as a specialty area of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. It is not a, well, adults, they're all just children. That, yeah. that doesn't transfer. Yeah. Thank you. No. So you could appeal who's making those decisions. I think that's something that you can bring up when you appeal the decision, but I don't think you're going to find that people are out there saying, I'm qualified for DD because I work with children. Um, I heard it. Thank you. I'm sorry that you heard it, and I'm... Um, 
I'd be interested in knowing who that was. If you'd be willing to share, ask me a note. Okay. So, so we're going to, uh, really conscious of time, I want to make sure we get to everybody that has a chance to come back. I just have a point of information question again, and I'm revealing my stupidity about the website for the department. I, I, I wondered if, and, and maybe you're going to say, it's already there. I wondered if there's a place where um, consumers' families can go a clear option on a website or a separate website or something where by topic you could go to something like appeals, due process, and there were frequently asked questions and it was clearly what we're what we're doing right now. If there's a place where you can go, is there a place because I I mean have to I'm be revealing my stupidity. Oh, no, no, no. The, um... In ordinary language, please. In order to get <laughs> oh, really? You want yeah. to get there too? <laughs> the, uh, so, so in the in the candor is that there there are there's a lot of this information on websites. Clarity. Clarity. And, and, and I think I think what, what, what I would say to you know, put this in a recommendation format for yes. have to write down is that one of the things that would really help a lot, especially for families, is that if there was some very Specific targeted places where people would absolutely know where to go. Absolutely. To have so, so is that suffice to say yes. without me having to say that the website is coming? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You haven't talked yet. Yeah, so I'm very quiet. Um, um, taking this over. I'm actually a uh, uh, disability advocate for partners on a voluntary basis now for about two years, and um, I just want, I just have a comment to make that. Uh, personally, I, I have dealt with the field, with Social Security, with Medicaid, with immigration. And to me, this appeals process seems like I would be um, trying to get an audience with the wizard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Mary, I promise I'll come back. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, so um, CMS on their website, when um, you look up long-term services and supports, it always includes IDD individuals. So why, if we are looking for true system reform and we are going to reform Medicaid, why does DD remain carved out in North Carolina? Everything that is happening on the federal level puts elderly, serious and persistent mental illness, other adult disabled, and DD into one category of long-term services and supports. There is, and I, when that whole Medicaid reform advisory group was going on, I kept asking and asking and asking. And if you're going to really push to get integrated care, then we need the same integrated care that the CAPDA individuals, people in skilled nursing facilities, they're in institutions just as we are in ICFMRs. So, so and this is the honest answer to it, is that... Um, one of these that happens when you say you're going to go out and listen to people and then try to include what people tell you in the plan that you propose is that everybody doesn't say the same thing. And, but, you know, I think you know that I went on the road a lot and listened to a lot of people. We had a lot of folks come in, and I would say the vast majority, and I, don't, I can't give you a percentage, but I, if, if it was below 90%, that would that would shock me. The vast majority of people that we spoke to said, um, one, you can't destabilize the system again, which means you can't get rid of this MCO system because, <clears throat> frankly, we've gone through enough, so stop doing that. Yeah. And two, we like the configuration of that, just improve it. Yes. And so that was what we heard back from people. Now, there were folks that said something different. And you were one of them, absolutely. But it is one of those things, when you listen to people, and there will be always somebody that feels differently, that I think we, we did a pretty good job of listening to people across the state. 
And that's really why we chose to do that. That's, I mean, that's the, that's the real answer. It's the best answer I got. It's the right one. That's why. Yes, sir. If you wanted to take away 90% of the stress in this room right now, home support's daily pay rate would do it. They just fix this whole deal. They'd take away from these appeals, from the appeals from last year's budget. It would fix it all. I, I think, I think, I think we heard it. I think we've written around several different ways. We've kind of written sideways, backwards, other ways. We've heard it. I promise you, we've heard it. We're writing it down. Uh, and, and again, I appreciate the, the clarity. Yeah, that's, that's good. Easy question. Uh, now, the last one was about the air thing. That was the easy question. Oh, that was easy. Um, did, are you going, I, I know I've gotten announcements mm -hmm. that you're going to the NCOs on the western side. Are you going all the way across? I think we have 10 scheduled to 10 visits. I can't remember the exact number. Is there a, is there a, a, a list on the website? Yeah. There is. And yeah, that is actually relatively easy to find. If you go on the front page of the uh, MHCDSA division website, there's a place that says.